Jr. Lucy Keshet. He's coming from uh, TCI Chicago. Um, he actually was showing up in Chicago right when I was leaving. I met him on the way out. Um, but we've been with each other since, and today he's going to be talking about some interesting work in the training, um, as well as some interesting work in voice, at, voice onset time and protection. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, hope you forgive me for the title. <laughs> So what I try to explain, what I try to present is several works. I, at least I'll present two of them, which are uh, one. It, so my work is focused on machine learning and on kind of signal processing for uh, for uh, speech recognition. And I try to address both of them. I try to present at least two or three works, and at the end I'll try to present the the work I'm doing now. Um, please stop me if you have any questions. So. This is how I see speech recognition nowadays. So it's like an old lady with uh, hearing problems. So we have, the, the <laughs> we have the acoustic features, which are kind of problematic. It's usually, as you know, it's usually sampled at uh, 10 milliseconds and span a window of 20 or 25 milliseconds of the spectrum. Um, there is acoustic modeling, which is a kind of machine learning model that try to address the, the sequential behavior of the, of the features. So if the features try to bear the information from the signal to, to, I don't know, a lower representation, the acoustic modeling try to, to take those, the, 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 the signal and, uh, and extract phoneme or subword units. Then we have pronunciation model, which try to to take those subword units and have them as a as a word, um, pronunciation modeling should address uh, problems in in reduction of uh, of pronunciation, of course. And then we have the language modeling, which try to address the combination of words into hopefully sentence, grammatical sentence, and. It should work in a different environment. It should be adaptable to anything, and usually it's trained on a speech corpora. But anyway, what I will do is like present work on one, two, three, like from acoustic modeling to uh, acoustic feature, acoustic modeling, and pronunciation models. And I'll present as along the way I present the problem in each of them. So this is a graph that I, I'm sure all of you have seen before. So this is the range of human error in transcription. I, I was last week I was visiting John Allen, a, f a friend of Hinek, and he also claimed that this is not correct. Actually, the human error is like around one percent, even less. So this is the database we use on speech. This is the NIST evaluation <coughs> over the year. So you see the year along this line, and you see the word error rate in, according to this line. And each color represents a different data set. This is really easy red speech and. Uh, this is air travel, this is maybe our uh, resource management, and this is switchboard, and you see CTS, which is like, I think Siri is a spin-off of that data, I think. And what you see is like the performance along the years. So you see that the performance are going down somehow. But if you look carefully, the trend is not like the human error, which doesn't go down along the years. Um, so the question is, where are we heading? Um, so in this talk, I'll first present a, a phoneme alignment algorithm with the direct cost minimization. So it's going to be a combination of uh, the machine learning work and the work I have done on uh, phoneme alignment. And then I'm going to present the phoneme recognition with also with direct cost minimization. So this is uh, linear models like uh, structural prediction, SVMs, CRF. And this is something else. This is a more general case for the HMMs. Um, then I present a different work of which I'm really excited. This is what I'm doing now. It's about VOT measurement. VOT is uh, the time between the the burst of the stop consonants and the and the and the vowel that uh, after that. And this is something that uh, humans and animals are really uh, 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 try to. It's something really perceptive. Something really that has to be really accurate in order to to. To use that, we use that in uh, linguistics, uh, in phonetic study. We use that in uh, speech analysis for uh, different kind of pathologies. And this is really exciting work because it's working. It's something that uh, we use now in phonetic studies, and it gives 
we can answer questions that we couldn't done before because now what happened in phonetic in the phonetic labs this is the most like this is the most uh, important uh, value that they measure and this measurement it takes i think uh, thousands of hours of uh, students uh, each year and now it it can do done in a few seconds and i will finish with the current and the future work so let me start with direct loss minimization what i'm going to do is like present that as a along the the the, the application of the of the first liner so we have the speech signal we have the the phonetic uh, we have the word uh, transcription the orthographic uh, orthographic transcription of it he's bought it and we have the phonetic transcription and what we want to do is like to align the we want to align each phoneme to the location in the speech signal okay this is the task we are given the speech signal we are given the phoneme or the orthographic transcription and we want to find these locations like h is going to be in the first frame time i don't know zero this is going to be in time seven milliseconds this is going to be time time to 200 milliseconds and seven i don't know what so we want to find this sequence of locations this is really nice problem for the direct loss minimization because it's like it's a simple problem but it has a different very nice cost and loss functions so we take the speech signal and we convert it into features acoustic features the standard features of mfcc which are taken every 10 milliseconds and span a window of 20 milliseconds so this is the acoustics uh, we take the words and convert them into phonemes by looking look up at a dictionary a lexicon and um, so the notation here is like we i know i denote the features with x bar bar means a sequence and it's bold face because it's a vector it's a sequence of vectors the phoneme is p bar which is a sequence of phoneme and we want to find the sequence the alignment sequence y bar which is a sequence of of times which is given in terms of the num the, the frame number so this is like frame 0 this is frame i don't know 3 this is frame 17 and so on and so forth. So we would like to predict y bar. Okay. Why would you prefer the boundaries rather than centers, for instance? Why do I prefer one? Boundaries between the phonemes rather than the centers of the phonemes. Would it be the center? Center. 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 Uh, uh, where the phonemes sound the center. Do you see that, yeah. you see that the boundaries are important? I don't know. I saw like this is the way traditionally it was done. I, I don't prefer I, actually the center, the core of the phoneme is much more accurate. But this is the definition of the problem. It's just an example problem how to to look to use the the cost minimization. So we define it as the the beginning of each word. Certainly true, but what is easier to get? Boundaries or centers? Yeah. I don't think so. I don't think so. The center where the most information lies is not necessarily the mean of the boundaries. Yeah. I, I, then you're going to tell me what you mean by center. Yeah. This, the core of yeah, the core of this this IY. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, you are right there. It's, it's what the timid guys were talking. Right, the boundaries is what the timid, the timid guys wrote. But I think that it's not the same problem. The core is like somewhere here. The boundary, like specifically here, or if it was nasal, can be like shifted. But there is, gra the, if you look at the signal, there is a huge gradient there. So this is the problem. We have the acoustics, we have the phoneme, and would like to predict uh, uh, the alignment sequence, the sequence of start time. So what interested in this task is like how do we measure how do we assess the value of the how good is that what we have so we have this the predicted sequence y bar prime and we have the presumably human labeled the sequence the the y bar and we would like to compare them so one way to compare them this is the standard way people do compare them is the number of times the difference is greater than tau so if this difference is less than tau we don't count it as error but if it's more than tau, let's say here, we count it, this is one error, this is zero, this is one. So maybe, I don't know, it's like three divided by 
five, six. So maybe it's half. So this is one way, just counting how many times it's greater than tau. Tau usually it's, I think, five, 10, 20, and 30 milliseconds. There is another way, which is, it's called the tau insensitive measurement. And then we, we count. So if the difference is uh, less than tau, it's zero. If, if it's more than tau, we, it's not just zero and one. We just have some kind of slope. And if it's really, if this is 17 and this is three, the difference um, uh, make a, makes a difference. And it's going to be uh, 17 minus 3, and it's, it's going to be 14, which is not like just 1. So this is a different cost function. So we have those cost functions. If you want to minimize those cost functions, or if you want a model, you want to minimize those cost functions, it's, it's not that easy. This is, this is a combinatorial value, which has like a lot of, uh, it's not differentiable. It has a lot of uh, um, minimas. So the ultimate goal is to find an alignment function which will minimize that in expectation. In expectation, it means that on unseen data, on data which we, we, are not, we don't see, but coming from the same source of the training set. So the expectation is taking over a sample of x, the acoustics, and p, the phonemes, and y, the alignment, the human label alignment. So we assume this linear model for time being. I'll speak later on how do we extend this model. But for time being, let's assume that we have a linear model. This linear model is a combination of two parts. So we have w, which is a weight vector, and phi, which is a, what we call feature maps. And each of them is of length n. And what I'm going to explain now is what are the feature maps I'm using, and then I'm going to explain how to train w so as to minimize the expected loss. So the feature maps have to be high if, if y bar makes sense uh, given x and p. We are trying to enumerate for all possible y bar, all possible alignment. And if y bar makes sense given x and p, it needs to be high. Otherwise, it needs to be low. And this is just a general guideline. It doesn't need to solve the problem, those fees. It just needs to be high if it makes sense and low otherwise. Then we multiply each of those phi by w. And it's like a weighted uh, phi. And we would like to have uh, our prediction to maximize those two. So first, I'm going to speak about those phi function. I'm going to do it really quick. So one example, which related to the boundaries and not to the core, is like the distance. So we have, we have the boundary. We have the frames. So assume you have two green frames and two uh, blue frames. And if the boundary makes sense, if y makes sense, we want, we want phi to be high. So if this boundary makes sense and we look at the distance between this and this, between those two frames, it's going to be high. If this boundary doesn't make sense, this is going to be low. You can see that in the spectrogram, this, this is going to be high. There is a gradient there. And this is going to be low. And we have a different features. We have, we, ha we have another feature which take into account uh, the posteriors along the sequence. So we, know, we assume that we know the phoneme sequence. We just know, don't know the boundaries. So if the boundary makes sense, this f uh, the, 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 the sum over the posteriors should be higher. Okay, If this boundary, for example, makes sense, the, this sum should be higher than if this doesn't make sense. And then we count, for example, those, the posteriors for B, while the correct phoneme here was A, O. This is more related to the, to the core uh, part of the phoneme. And then we have some model for the duration of the phonemes. You can see that it's, the whole thing is like a segmental model or segment-based model. So we have the duration of the model. If, if the duration of AO makes sense, it's supposed to be uh, longer the pl than the plosives, then it would have a higher score. Otherwise, it will have a lower score. And then we have a model of the speaking rate. So we just uh, look at the speaking rate. Of, we, we just look at the production of the phoneme a long time. It has to be steady. I mean, you cannot speak very fast and very slow at the same time. And so those are the fees. They're supposed to make sense, again, if x and p are, are if y bar is relevant to x and p, and otherwise they don't. Um, now we need to train w. So we want to train w so as to maximize 
uh, the loss. I wanted to, to note here that this model W dot phi is exactly the match filter if you assume Gaussian noise. This, I spoke a lot about match filter today. So this is exactly the match filter if you, if phi were linear, phi were linear, and if you assume Gaussian noise, this is exactly the match filter with a, with a map uh, estimation. So how do we find W? So again, re recall that this is, this is the goal. And we want to minimize that. So what we do is like we want to find W so as to minimize the loss. So usually what we, we would do if we were in, um, like uh, taking a first course in, uh, in phi, we will uh, take the gradient of the expected loss. Um, taking the gradient is not so easy. So we, we would take the gradient and compare it to 0. This, is the, this would find the minimum of this function. This is, this is hard because sometimes you cannot take the gradient directly. What we assume here, nev nevertheless, is that the gradient of the expected loss exists. Okay? We, we don't assume that the gradient of the loss exists. We assume that the gradient of the expected loss exists. It's called the uh, 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 proper positioning of the, of the loss. And then taking and comparing it to zero, it's also uh, very hard. If we could find the gradient, we can do something like that, which is a gradient descent type of algorithm, stochastic gradient descent algorithm, that go over the examples, and for each examples update according to the gradient of this loss function. So how do we do that? Right, right. Even though the length of x and y bar varies from example to example, and some of the features you described, they look like there would be one of them for every possible boundary. So if y bar had, let's say, k boundaries in it, there would be k places where you would look at whether the two sides are sufficiently different. There would be k plus one places where you would look at the right, right. duration, the duration are sensible. Do you want to say a bit more about how you go from the variable number of things yeah, okay, so the idea here, I have a misnotation because the, the P is missing here. Yeah, that's okay. But this is the, the general case. So the whole idea of phi is to make the, the variable length sequence into one. So maybe I didn't explain that. So usually we sum over the phi, so we do something else, or we take the max, or we take the mean. But we have for each feature, we have one real value. So. If you consider, for example, the boundaries, we know, because we know the phonemes, we know we have the k phonemes, so we just sum them. So we, we know we need to sum k boundaries, and we have one real number for all the for di distances. We can sum all the duration, the presumed duration. We can sum all the speaking rates. We have one number. For each of those, we have one number. And then you, you have a, a full signal, but you, you end up with one number. So we, overall, we have n of those. And is it important to normalize by the number of that this number k in different examples of different numbers? Do you sort of normalize? No, 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 not at all. No, 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 no. It will be more extreme in the second, uh, in the third example that I will show. So, so we came up with this theorem, which look a little bit odd at the beginning, but it's really um, really nice and, and, and important and has a lot of intuition into that. So, so let me present that first. So what we have here is we have two predictions. One is the prediction with the model w dot phi. Again, p is missing, p is given, so you can assume that it's part of the x. So we have w dot phi. This is the standard prediction we are using in this model. And then we have another prediction, w dot phi plus epsilon l. L is the same loss function, the same cost function that we used in the, that I presented this particular loss function. And this can be computed easily with a dynamic programming, programming because this is separable. It was, it's separable in the number of phonemes. Um, we multiply it by epsilon. So now the theorem says that the gradient of the expected loss is going to be this thing. So this is phi. When we plug in instead of y, instead of the boundaries, we plug in this prediction. And here, instead of the correct boundaries, we plug in this prediction. So we have two predictions plugged in here. Okay? So if you look at, 
if you look at that carefully, if you plug in, if epsilon equals 0 in this case, those are the same, right? And this is going to be 0. But if it's not 0, if epsilon is not 0, just a little bit above 0, what we get here is exactly the gradient. And, and I'll try to explain you why is that. Um, so this is the definition of the gradient. It, it's, if you remember the, defi the, the basic definition of the derivative is over there in yellow. And what we did here, this is exactly the definition of the gradient. OK? And this is one side of the theorem. The other side is this thing. This is the theorem itself. This is the gradient. And what we did is we showed that the right hand side of this part and the right hand side of that part are the same. You can do that by explicitly write this expectation is, a, is integral over the decision boundary between the, this and this. I put here w, but it's the same as without w, OK? Just to make, the, to make it clearer. So, so this is an integral over the decision boundary, and this is also the integral over the decision boundary. And when epsilon goes to 0, those are equal. It's not approximation. They are really equal, both of them. Um, I have a slide showing that, which I skip here. So this is the decision boundary, the, the, the blue surface. Okay. So one side of the theorem, I call this delta L, L minus L. So this is the surface, and we're going to do integral over this surface multiplied by some term. So this is delta W, delta W, and delta phi, which is phi minus phi there. So we're going to, this is just to give you the intuition about the proof. So it's the integral over delta L times this. The other theorem in blue, it's the integral over delta phi multiplied by delta L. And the whole thing equal the same. Well, this term. So this is this is how the proofs go. It's the the rest is just mathematics. And this is the this is the the algorithm. I guess you understand from from what I said before. So you just predict with the previous w, you predict with the previous w, but with a loss adjusted. And then you update it like that. Okay, and you have to tune epsilon, so as to be minimum, but not not minimal. That those are the same. So how we tune epsilon is like we take, we compute that, and we say, OK, let's have like 80% or 50% of the training set having difference between the predicted one and, and the, the loss adjusted one and the predicted one. So here are the results for this exactly phoneme uh, uh, error rate. So in the first line, you see um, this is standard HMM system with additional features, Brugnar et al, 93. This is why we use the same setup. Cache et al was a work that was done in my PhD. This is a struct um, structural SVM. This is SVM. And Hoson 2009, it's the best system so far. What the number here are is exactly the loss that I uh, wrote there. So t less than 10% means that we count error. This is tau. So it's like we count error as everything that is less than 10%. So 86, uh, mean, uh, 79, for example, means that 79, so this is not an error, this is accuracy. So it means like 79.7 of time, the correct boundaries were within 10 milliseconds. OK? This is the percentage within the correct uh, boundaries. So those two are the, are the system I presented here when they, one of them is trained on the tau alignment and the other was the tau insensitive. And you see the, it's huge difference. Like, it's like, see for the first column, 86 compared to 79. This is huge uh, difference. This is almost the, as the Intel Cyber Agreement on this data set. So this is just an example. I didn't do anything. Those two uh, results are the, the, have the same feature, the same setup as the second one. This is uh, exactly the same. This is ultimate, yeah. I don't have the results here. I'm, I'm using it later on in the talk on switchboard. Yeah, this is just team it in, the, in this setup. Yeah, in it, I would assume not because on switchboard, for example, the intertranscriber agreement is actually nowhere near this good. So isn't this for the phone number? 
this is everything timid according uh, this is number, these numbers are also according to timid it's not that published yeah, yeah. no no but what i'm saying is that uh, Kinect was wondering whether this would be similar on switchboard and i'm saying no because even humans can't agree on about yeah and so i don't know if the machine will do as good as this so because i remember i, I don't know if the number is published but when they were transcribing switchboard phonetically they yeah Comparing to labeling done by MIT, right? Yes, yes, yes. Right. Is, it, all, all I mean, is, it, I mean, is, is this what we really want to compare to or not? No, no, I, I would say it's labeling done on carefully articulated speech versus. But by, by, by humans. In both cases, yeah. by humans. Yeah. This is, uh, you can. Uh, 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 like this task, I don't know. You can agree if, if it uh, makes sense or not. But this is—I just wanted to present yeah. the, the algorithm on well, that. No, I, I don't question. The, 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 the. This is the result. Yeah, he claimed Hanson. It's the best result for for the team. It's so far. So apparently, those guys. So I'm coming from uh, electrical engineering, from speech recognition, a little bit from machine learning. Those guys—they are personally young. Alexander Bouchard. Court and Dan, uh, Dan Klein, and then there is Ben Tasker there, uh, with David Chiang, Kevin Knight, Wei Wang. All of those guys they are from machine translation. So first, when I put those thick pictures, I was shocked. Everybody is happy. We are in speech recognition. We are really sad. <laughs> Nothing. We are not that happy. <laughs> except, except from Ben Tasker, he's from machine learning. He's a little bit. So anyway, those guys they know something we don't know. They're. So in those work, which are really important work, both of them use direct loss minimization. This is a. This is the work of personally. Uh, no, this is the work of Ben Tasker. So here the blue is in plus, and we use minus because blue is like it's not loss, it's utility. And there is the work of uh, Percy Young, which also it's hidden here. This is what they call up to, uh, up, update toward the option with the highlight blue score. Um, let me now go to a different model, which is more, more uh, extended model for, for the direct loss minimization, direct cost mini minimization. So we have an HMM model. And I put here P of x and s. s are the states. And theta is the model parameters, OK? So this is the HMM. We have a st starting state. We have the transition between the states, and we have the emission probability. This is the standard HMM. And I think during this part, I'm, I'm presenting one state per, per phoneme or per word, but you can use uh, many states just for the clarify. So again, bar means a sequence, or S bar means a sequence of, uh, of, of states. And the question is, how do we minim minimize the uh, loss or a cost function? So the main works on that, the MMI, the MC, and the MP, MM, MWE, are amazing because before we, we just look at that uh, like minimizing a loss function only now and those works are I think from the first one is 97 or something it's this is amazing that how come but the speech community is always before uh, the other communities um, most notably is the work of, da of Dan MP MWE because this work is actually minimizing the the thing we want to minimize it's this is the expectation okay of of the of the probability of the loss divided by the probability, this is really related. This is hardly related to the direct loss minimization. So if you look at the, the, the denominator here, and you take a log, this is exactly the same thing. And this is so we have two prediction in direct loss minimization. One of the prediction is this one, and the other is that one. And what I'm trying to do those days is like to prove that this is also consistent. I show half the way that this is consistent to the base optimal solution it's not done yet but um, this is like the right thing to do if you want so in that sense this is the yeah this is the right thing to do this is the way to minimize the the loss another work that was done was trying to find the large margin online training and then those guys uh, Chiang and Fei Sha and Larry Sol they try to uh, have a prediction which is loss adjusted with raw. Okay, this is the loss. This is word error rate or frame error rate. This is the standard uh, 
li li likelihood, and the rho is a parameter which they can call the, the margin. And the update rule is as follows. They put here the correct sequence. They put here the, loss the rho adjusted sequence, this sequence. And this is the update rule for a, for a margin-based uh, uh, HMM. I put here derivative according to theta, but this is something analytic. I cannot, it's like too long to put that here. But if you assume GMM and stuff like that, this is a, there is an analytical solution to the gradient uh, of the log of the P. OK, so this is the theorem for, for that case. So again, we have a prediction. We have a prediction which is loss adjusted. And then we take the derivative of, 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 of those terms. The derivative can be computed analytically. And we have one term, which is the loss, which is the epsilon loss adjusted, and one term, which is just the prediction. Uh, both of them are, they can be computed uh, with the with the with Viterbi algorithm. Okay, so this is the theorem. This is also holds. And as you can see, the target sequence, the target sequence in all of those algorithms come into account only by the loss function. Okay, so we like. You can think about it as we try to steer our update rule toward the loss. Um, so this is the algorithm. Again, predicting, predicting and plug it in. What I wanted to tell you is like, OK, if this was the correct sequence, you get the large margin update. And if this was the correct sequence and you plug here S prime, not S prime, epsilon, just S prime, you get the percepton uh, update. So this update is something in between the percepton update and the, and the large margin update. Um, again, I, I, I try to look at it as denominator of uh, MPE or MWE and the denominator. So those are the results. I took a uh, uh, system, Chang and, uh, and Larry Sol system, as is, just plug in the, the update rule. And you see it's like lower for every, for every number. This is, one is with phoneme error rate, the previous is with frame error rate. Um, do you have any question before I continue to the second part? Yeah, you can play with that. You know, the, the, the gradient you can define as plus epsilon minus epsilon. So I could put like a plus, a, a minus epsilon L over there and plus here. You can put minus and plus. You can play with that as long as you keep the correct uh, direction. And there's, there's the no, I mean, whatever. Uh, like, have you seen any, does it make any difference or any else? Yeah, minus work much better. If you put minus epsilon in the previous scenario, it's more much better because it's like, uh, I think it's like, well, it's, it's more similar to the structural prediction. You're going into the direction of the loss. This is like, like, like to go in the negative direction of the negative loss. I don't know if there are. So why did you do it plus? Because it was easier to implement. I took hair, hair code, just plugging it there. They have the code for percept. I don't even remember. It was so easy like to change the code from because of laziness. <laughs> so is this like a form of, it's a bit like MPE, but there's kind of power boundaries somehow. Is, is that right? I, I get the impression that on the left and the right, there may be two different transcripts that you got kind of with epsilon, without epsilon. Right. The two di yeah, there are two different transcripts. One is like more adjusted to the loss, to the frame error, and one is less. And you try to update. OK, so if the one on the right-hand side was, let's say, the true, the transcribed, the human transcribed one, then that would be MLI, I guess. <coughs> oh, sorry, if, the one, if, what, if you had taken one of them to be the If this is the correct one, you want to you want to make it in the plus the correct one and the minus the, the bad one. This is the good guy, this is the better. one. Yeah. Otherwise. If you put here y, this is the, like a large margin. I think large margin is the MMI. I think it's the same. It's close to the. Oh, 
okay, so the y is the... Uh, no, MMI is like percepton, sorry. I think MMI is like percepton. It's like putting the right here and here, it's like without the epsilon, like epsilon equals zero. Okay. But uh, the, the connection is not, is not there. Okay, like so which is the worst transcript? The worst transcript is the one with epsilon or with that? Okay. Yeah, but you cannot think about it like that because when you put, when you don't have the correct one, what matters is like the difference between them. I could put minus epsilon here and yeah. without epsilon here and... So if epsilon is small, it doesn't matter, I guess, whether it's minus or plus epsilon, then it's small. Yeah, according, only if you take the right direction, yeah. It still matters, I mean, because, because yeah, you want to make sure you get the right You can put minus epsilon here and plus epsilon here, and that might be faster. I, I spoke with the... They do, yeah. they do both. G give, it, give it an answer. They say, let's try to find a lot of things which, uh, a lot of slightly worse things and a lot of slightly better things in terms of loss, but which are close to, uh, which you can almost achieve with the current weight factor, and then update for the better things away from the worse things. So, so you'll see so on this slide, it's updating away from a slightly worse thing, and on an earlier slide, is that when that be updated toward a slightly better thing? This, this is the fastest option. It's like, which, which like with minus epsilon and plus epsilon. It's like somehow fastest than, than everything else. You make faster. Yeah, so I spoke with uh, McDermott about, yeah, I remember. I spoke with the McDermott, if we can come up with a rule like the MPE, which has like the denominator and the denominator have both, uh, both terms. I don't know, I mean, it's, we didn't come into conclusion with that. So those are the numbers. So let me speak about a different walk, which I'm really excited about. This is what I'm doing now, most of the time. So VOT is, is the duration between the burst onset and the starting of the voice. This is really important in many, many aspects of speech recognition. Um, so we know we have, sorry? So we know we have a, per, uh, per, um, how do you call it? Uh, perceptual, categorical, percep categorical perception. So I try to, um, try to uh, somehow s simulate that by, by this uh, uh, plug. So if the VOT is less than 25 milliseconds, we think it's a B. If it's more than 25 milliseconds, we think, we think it's P. And it actually, the VOT is something that is, uh, is moving smoothly, but, uh, but uh, perceptual is different. This is in the standard uh, production of B and P. We will see later on that in uh, extreme production, this is not true. So we know that infant at the age of one to four months can detect that. We know that even chinchillas can detect that. They, it's a very known <laughs> science uh, journal. So they try, so what they do, they swipe the VOT along the way from, from uh, I think it's T and D, and they detect that. Uh, it's a cue for the place of uh, the location and the place of articulation. It's really important in disorder, in disordered speech and uh, so uh, it's a main tool in analyzing uh, phonetical studies like uh, speech production, speech errors. Um, the last interspeech, there was a paper about depression and VOT. So what, uh, uh, with the collaboration with uh, Zach Shafran for OHSU, OGI, what we try to do is like um, people with Parkinson's disease have to go to be examined every uh, month, I think to say how, how shaky they are. It's called the uh, MUPDRS, uh, I think Emotional Universal DMP, Parkinson Disease Score, MPDRS. So this is a number between uh, 1 or 0 and 109. And we try to predict that. So those, uh, those people are now calling to a call center and they say pataka, 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 and, uh, and we analyze their voice. And according to that, we estimate the UPDRS. This is really nice uh, work. So we try to. So there are several works on that, but somehow none of them are really uh, applicable to a huge data set. Um, and some of them, even most of them, use MFCC. So I have to tell you that the VOT can be as uh, short as a few milliseconds, and the MFCC span a window of 20 or 25 milliseconds, and you cannot just shrink the MFCC. So we need to come up with a different uh, um, signal processing here. But anyway, whenever we look, we even look at the App Store and the uh, Android Store, there is no app for that. You cannot take an uh, algorithm and use it like for a huge data set. So let me define the, the problem again. So there is a time of the burst, 
There is the time of the voicing, TV and TB. This is what we call a positive VOT. It's like when you say bye. There might be a, a negative VOT when the, the voicing time is before the, the burst time. So there are languages that have that, like Spanish and Portuguese and uh, many Indian languages. In Hebrew, we don't have negative VOT, but what happened is like there was a show um, for like teenage uh, girls and something, so they wanted to say, we say bye in Hebrew, like in English. So they wanted to say bye and go away. So <laughs> the combination was mm, bye. So we put the pre-voicing, so now we have pre-voicing in Hebrew. There is a, the, the mm, bye is like pre-voice for bye. Um, anyway, so in this work, we define a loss function which is uniquely determined the, the VOT. It's similar to the, to the, loss, to the loss function of the uh, force aligner. And we, again, we would like to minimize uh, the loss function. We have the same model. This is the, the match filter model, a linear model. We have a training set of examples. The training set of examples includes, includes some acoustic uh, features, which are not the MFCCs, and the time of the burst and the time of the voicing. And then we have, um, we define the acoustic from scratch. What we did is like we sampled the signal at one millisecond and span a window of, it's a mistake, it's, it's a span a window of one or five millisecond. So we have seven features like that, seven acoustic features. One of them is low energy, high energy, winner entropy, total energy, uh, autocorrelation function, zero crossing, uh, uh, voicing, the pitch, the voice, uh, the, the, like the voicing of the pitch. And all those functions are sampled at one millisecond. And you see that there is somehow correlation. This is the time of the burst. This is the time of the voicing. There is some correlation between what happens with the features and the, and the actual uh, burst. And it's, uh, it's before. I don't remember what was the, I can look it up. You see what? In the beginning, I know you're showing me the voice onset uh, gap the, from 0 up to 120. Right. right. But then there's another thing which looks a whole lot like it. What is that gap over there? Or I guess it's just I don't like remember what was, the, what was said like here. But it's not similar, because this algorithm like, works really well on that. No, no, no. Ah, this is this is the same signal. I just plot the three, like two features in each figure, but it, instead of plotting all of them together, and you see that some of the features are high at the burst ti at the voicing time, some of them are high at the at the burst time, and we need somehow to combine them together. I forgot to say that we are not synchronized to the beginning. Of course, we are not saying that we are taking after 20 milliseconds. It, it's not synchronized. You have a, a signal. Uh, you have a word. You can spend a, 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 a big window. You can spend a short window. The only thing is that you will have at least one VOT there. And then the algorithm will spot the first VOT. So what I want to describe now is how do you choose phi. So those phi functions are just, so what we did is like we go to those uh, phonetician and they label their VOT for all their PhD. And they say, OK, first I look at the high energy and I see that there is a raise there. And then I put TB. And then I look at the uh, low energy, and I see there is a raise there. And then I put TB. In. And they describe the process for us. And this is the way we build the feature. We have 59 features like that. So here, for example, you see one feature of those. Again, it's like it's supposed to take a, any sequence length and convert it into one real number, each feature. Okay? So one of the features is the mean from the beginning of the signal to TB, and then the mean of the the signal from TB to TV. And you see this mean is going to be high if those are in the correct location. And if it's not in the correct location, you see it's going to be lower. The difference between them are, is lower. Okay. So we have 59 features like that. The, max, the maximum of the feature, the sum of them, the, 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 the mean of them, the, the mean minus the mean, which is denoted here by delta. And all of those features designed by hand to this problem and it was, uh, yeah, it was according to the work with the phonetician. 
And we train W with a passive aggressive. This is standard structure prediction, large margin algorithm. We just predict and plug it in here. This is the true TB and TV for the example M. And this is the predicted TB and TV. And we can show, this is something old, we can show that this is also converges to minimizing the loss under some condition. And it's compatible with the best predictor in this class. So here are the results. So we compare our approach to other people, specific, specifically for Stout and Van Ham. So what you see here is like, again, how many times the VOT was within 10 milliseconds, for example. So in our algorithm, which is blue, you see it's a little bit below. Sorry, Stout and Van Ham is a little bit below 80%, uh, and our algorithm is a little bit be, be, uh, above 80%. So as higher is better. And we compare it to Lin and Wang. Right, right. Is, like, I guess the more difficult cases are the short ones, right? Because yes. So can you say something about how many of your tokens the reference VOT was less than 5? Is that, is that no. Okay. Well, I can show you something else. Okay. So this is comparison to this, those guys, Lin and Wang. This is actually can run only on 5% of Timit. We are, we are not interested in Timit in this setup, and Timit is really small. but. Uh, so what we did is like we took switchboard and we this was hand labeled in University of Chicago by, by with a phonetician there. So what we did is we compare our model with the manual transcription and we compare several so there were five transcribers there. We compare the transcriber and we see that the intertranscriber agreement is the same or almost the same as the automatic transcription. And then we continue continue fur further. So the, the main issue with this algorithm was that the the, the Mark Zonderger, he wanted to, to have a, an experiment, like a closed experiment on linguistics. And he would like to somehow isolate it, a, a group of people for a month and see how the VOT changes over the months. Because we know there are some uh, phenomena, especially, for example, if I speak with Dan, he has a um, uh, UK accent, I have Israeli accent, the VOT is going to converge like after 10, um, I think 10 minutes, something like that, 8 uh, minutes, called the... Uh, accommodation, it's called many things. And they want, he wanted to check that. So he didn't know how to do that until he came up with the idea of uh, the Big Brother. So this is a show in the UK that uh, <laughs> 30 people voluntarily being, uh, are located in one house, one room, and they speak together. And it's a very nice um, uh, a place to check uh, their, their uh, phonetic variation over uh, middle term. So I have to, to tell you that this is really innovative because there was no evidence for midterm linguistic study like that. There are other linguistic study like 10 minutes, and there are linguistic studies of uh, Queen Elizabeth which take years. But something like that which take months, it's something really new. So the speech here is, is really hard. Jennifer is in the dining room. What is the atmosphere like in the house? This morning, everyone seems to be really so happy and um, really you got that. It, she's like have a lot of deletions of the plosives at the end of the sentence. But this is Katria. This is her <laughs> close enemy, and she has a Filipino accent. This is amazing. Let, let me explain you why she's hungry. The big brother don't let her eat cookies. This is the reason. <laughs> so this is amazing. This is really a hard speech to work with. So this was annotated, annotated and at MIT, at University of Chicago, and I forgot where, you know? I forgot where. No, he was guiding students to do that. I, maybe. So this is really hard data. This is American accent. Uh, UK accent, British accent. So you see the difference between inter-transcriber agreement and the auto agreement, and also the same. And then we continue with that. We take the model and check it on the on other data set, like the train model on other data set. 
But what I wanted to, s to show you is how it works with the real phonetic study. So this is one phonetic study which bilingual of Portuguese, which has negative VOT, hence all the VOT is like going down compared to monolingual American speech. So what you see in red is the, the red is the, uh, our algorithm, and blue is the manually labeled algorithm. This is huge. This is, I think, I forgot how much it, it, it is. This is like 7,000 words, and they hand label that. It's, I don't know how they do that. Anyway, the, it's like 99 correlation, and got the same uh, results, the same qualitative results. The other work that I'm doing now in Northwestern University is with the Jeremy Needle and Goldrick. So the thing is the tongue twister. So, so colliders or partic particle accelerators are used as a research tool in particle physics. So what you do, it, you take the elements and you have a very high energy, a very high kinetic energy, and you let them impact uh, with other particles, and then you, the system goes to, into extreme state. What we do in uh, phon phonology, phonetics is that we use tongue twister. This is like taking the language system into extreme and we try to look at the errors of those. And this is a fully, this is, I think it's the first, this is what they claim, it's the fully automatic phonetic study, the first study. We use the force aligner, we locate body, the location of the plosives, we predict the VOT and have some kind of statistical analysis. Um, let me show you an, a demo of that, and by that I will end the, the talk. So this is something that used to take one hour for, for a person to do. You need to believe me that I took random file from the set. You have no choice but to believe me. Let's put time, how much time it takes. This is force aligning. They take the transcription automatically. Yeah, that's it. It was very brave that I presented that because it's not like ongoing work. So it took like, uh, 3.4 seconds instead of the whole file instead of uh, four hours, like one hour, sorry. And then if you look at the results, this is Pratt. This is really accurate. You see, this is the VOT for those. So this is a clean speech. This is data that is really clean. It's really different from speech recognition because what we need here is really accurate. There is not much noise or something like that. Although, by the way, this algorithm is really robust to noise. But the thing is that we need really, really accurate, like high accuracy here. You see, it's like 0 0.9. It's like uh, the number here is, is a second. So it's like 99 millisecond accuracy here. Um, Nothing human here, nothing. We have the wave signal. This was generated automatically because we know the patterns. They say para, 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 or they say bad, bad, bad. This ge generated automatically. This is the processing window that we give to the algorithm because the force alignment usually have mistakes and the P can be here or I don't know where. So it's really big. <laughs> this number referred to this phoneme, which is the 45th phoneme. And this is the VOT. There is nothing like human here. Yeah, we have all the VOTs there, and we could, yeah. So let me finish. Um, so um, the other works I'm working on is on pronunciation modeling, when you have the phonemes and you want to predict the word. And we could, like, again, designing features and designing the algorithm, we could go from 60, which is the dictionary lookup, to 14. This is the error. 
Uh, I have another work on um, speech intelligibility before and after chemotherapy, this tongue twister. And um, I just want to thank my collaborator. This is David McAllister, Tamir Hazan for the direct loss minimization. The VOT is Katie and Morgan, uh, the students, and uh, Chiang and Mark, the students for the phoneme recognition. And this is the phonetic study. This is Jeremy, and Natalia, and uh, Mark, uh, Matt Goldrick from Northwestern University. Okay, thank you. This is like this is like if I did because ninety percent of the cases that you find in the wild would have negative VOT. Yeah, this is like an invited question. We have a work that just presented an inter speech. I didn't present here for negative VOT. So just when I look at the curves and I see that so the, the sharp part of the curve all falls in the in the middle, the middle section. Yes. Which of course is the tail of the of the pre uh, of the pre voice distance. How do you confine your sample to uh, uh, examples that have um, zero to you know, have VOTs in that range that you're, that, you're, that you're showing? So some of the data we did, we took only the initial voiceless stops, and some not. Some it's just the distribution of American English and UK English. But we have a, a system now. The current system, actually, the results that I show you on this, the current system, like the demo, was with a, our system currently handle negative VOT and positive VOT. It's like two systems working in parallel. You can have like also zero VOT. You can have many things as you wish. And it's working on parallel and give the same results. The problem with the negative VOT is that we didn't have anybody to compare with. So we compare it to ourselves. That, that, that's it. Yeah. Because it's, uh, negative VOT has no independent uh, value, but it occurs all over the place. Right, right. You won't be able to measure it unless you very carefully control the condition. Yeah, it's really hard to measure that because you don't know the initial look. Okay. We have some results on that, and they look similar to that. We try to to give the so there was guidelines that were given to the phonetician how to mark that VOT, and we follow those guidelines when we designed the negative part of the algorithm. But it, it probably worked the same as the positive VOT. We, we use that now. We use that in uh, Spanish data. We use that on. There's going to be a paper on the, the phonetic study about it, which was again the same results as the human results in that case. Right. You have guaranteed that some, it was a sentence initial stop consonant, right? Because yeah, I presented only half of that. This this data set has a negative VOT, and we have, we presented results on that in the last inter speech with KT. No, but whatever it is, that data set is prompted speech, right? It's not spontaneous. What is it? Um, I mean, the way you described it, I thought that this it was is initial silence followed by the word, which begins. This is prompt speech, yeah. This is from, but so the, the, the examples are what they are. And, but then, the, for example, with the Big Brother. Big Brother and Switch World are spontaneous. Yeah. How do you choose the examples? Do you actually look for things that are marked with the positive VOT but nothing to the left? The, the label was for all examples. You, we took a sentence and just labeled that. It's not we, it's like it was done with phoneticians. And they mark positive and negative. And I think we, in one experiment, took only the positive. In one experiment, took everything. I think what I presented here is with everything. And in one experiment, we took only the negative part. And we, we took, check, like the switch board, I think it was 5% negative, something like that. 4% of the data was. And, and 
And the curve you're showing us was not the DOT, it was the error in the estimate of the DOT. Yeah, it was the error, yeah. It's the relative error in the estimate of the VOT. Like if it's 10 milliseconds, it means like it might be negative. It means that it's 10 milliseconds of the offset of the, the, the transcriber or several transcribers in average. Okay, that's why I was asking my question that rather than show me the absolute error, if you showed me an error, because that's how it would become important. That's when it would be important. The part you're going to do No, no, it's relative error. If it's a millisecond DOT, then a 10 millisecond error is a large error. But if oh, very few of them were 10 millisecond DOT, then a, like, you know, and let's say the average was 20, then a 5 millisecond error is a good error. So, yeah, it's it's so like we're more worried about how what is essentially a continuous measurement, right. which becomes discrete depending on the language you're dealing with, because some languages have three divisions. Yeah, this is the yeah we define it like that. So we define. So if it's negative and this is negative, it still is going to be. Yeah, if this is negative and this is negative, it's still going to be positive. Like we take the absolute value of that. We use the same cost also in the other world. OK, thank you very much.